Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the NHGRI NCATS Organic Acidemia and Homocystinuria meeting. My name is Jennifer Sloan, and I'm a genetic counselor and staff scientist in the Venditti Lab at NHGRI. I'm happy to be here today to moderate the first session on disorders of cobalamin and homocysteine metabolism. For those of you who were unable to under attend yesterday, um, some quick logistics of the meeting. The talks are pre-recorded, so we're going to play the talks, and then there will be live um, Q&A for five minutes at the very end of the, each session. So please submit your questions in the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And I should mention that recordings will be available um, on the website after the event. Um, we're not going to do extensive introductions today because every uh, bio is available also on our website. So to kick off the meeting, our first speaker is Dr. Rosenblatt, who's a professor at McGill and chief of the Division of Medical Genetics at the Jewish General Hospital. Dr. Rosenblatt has been instrumental in the diagnostic testing for cobalamin disorders and has been involved in almost all of the gene discovery efforts in this pathway, which has really a major impact on the field. And today he's going to give us a nice overview of the intracellular cobalamin pathway and related inborn errors of the cobalamin metabolism. So thank you, Dr. Rosenblatt. So I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak this morning. I would like to give an overview of uh, the steps in vitamin B12 metabolism that involve remethylation of homocysteine to methionine. My disclosures are that I do have both uh, research grants from the CIHR and as a collaborator from the NIH. And I have helped in the preparation of these slides by David Watkins and Ms. Natasha Anastasia. My objectives are to review the steps involved in the uptake and intracellular transport and metabolism of vitamin B12, and then to show the spectrum of inherited diseases associated with the remethylation of homocysteine to methionine. And remethylation is very important because folate-derived methyl groups are used for both DNA methylation, RNA methylation, neural transmitter synthesis, lipid methylation, and protein modification. There are many inborn errors involved in the remethylation of homocysteine to methionine in the cobalamin pathway. And these are the ones I'm gonna to touch about as we go through. As I give the talk, we'll be talking first on the mechanistic law side, and then on uh, more of the clinical conditions that are associated with it. And what is very striking is that many of the steps that have turned up in the B12 pathway have been uh, learned from studying individual patients, sometimes as few as one. So this is an overview of the entire pathway, and I'll come back to this slide um, in steps as we go through but it's just to orientate you. It will also be my final slides, so you'll be able to absorb it as we go through the talk. First of all, once B12 has been absorbed from the intestine and circulates in uh, the blood bound to transcobalamin, which is the active circulating form uh, of vitamin B12, so B12 bound to transcobalamin, it has to get endocytose into cells. And then it has to get to lysosomes, where the TC comes off the uh, receptor in the acidic environment of the lysosome, and then uh, the uh, free B12 is released into the lysosome. So there you have the uh, figure of the endocytosis of TC, uh, cobalamin, and uh, the uh, transportation into the lysosome. Not much is known about the pre-lysosomal steps between the endocytosis and the arrival of the mature lysosomes. And I think that's still an area right pre -study. Once in the lysosome and released from uh, transcobalamin, free B12 has to be transported across the lysosomal membrane into the cytoplasm. And this process requires two proteins. One is LMBD1, which is encoded by LMBRD1, and ABCD4 encoded by ABCD4 gene. Now, ABCD4 is an ATP binding cassette transporter, and LMBD1 targets ABCD4 to the lysosomal membrane. And there's the visualization of that step. 
So there are two diseases that are involved in the transport of FeeB12 across the lysosomal membrane. And they both present metabolically with combined methamalonic aciduria and homocystinuria. We still study cultured cells from patients, and you will find decreased propionate incorporation, which is a functional measurement of the methylmalonyl-CoA mutase pathway, which I'm not going to talk at all uh, today, and also decreased methyl tetrahydrofolate incorporation, which is a surrogate, if you want, for a function of methionine synthase. Interestingly and importantly, cells from these patients accumulate B12, and they actually accumulated as free vitamin B12 in the lysosome, and they had decreased synthesis of both cofactors, adenosyl B12 and methyl B12. The Cabalman F patients have failure to thrive, feeding difficulties, persistent stomatitis, they can have macrocytic anemia. Interestingly, they can have um, dysmorphology, minor, minor facial anomalies, and congenital heart disease. And there are not many of these. There are 17 patients of all in the literature, and there are only nine different mutations, but there is a common mutation in this disorder, which most patients have. Cabalamin J, which is even rarer, again, feeding difficulties, can have bone marrow suppression, again, congenital heart defects. There are three Chinese patients who are homozygous with the same mutation and seem to have a milder biochemical phenotype. So now the free B12 has come out of the lysosome, and then it binds to a protein called MMACHC, which is thought to act as a chaperone, binding the newly absorbed vitamin B12 and passing it on to the other cabalmin binding proteins. It may bind to LMDR1, uh, LMBD1, ABCD4, MMADHC, and the MMACHC, MMADHC complex may bind to the methionine synthase. Now, MMACHC also has a uh, enzymatic effect where it removes the upper axial ligand if one is present by reductive decyanation or by glutathione-dependent dealkylation, and it generates cob 2 alum. And there's your step of MMACHC after the B12 has come out of the lysosome and being uh, shuttled to join the MMADHC. Now, as it turns out, disorders in the MMACHC gene is the most common inborn error of vitamin B12 metabolism. And there are over 1,200 published cases now, right now. It has presentation at different ages, depending on the mutation. There can be an early onset with presentation at, at less than one year, late onset presentation after a year, any time in childhood, adolescence, or adulthood. Now, the early onset forms can have feeding difficulties, hypotonia, lethargy, abnormal movement, seizures, multi-system involvement, megaloblastic anemia, which is, of course, the hallmark of clinical vitamin B pill deficiency, pancytopenia, a very specific salt and pepper retinopathy and maculopathy, and moderate to severe cognitive disability. The late, there's a later onset, which can be in childhood often, which has a renal phenotype, they can have an atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. They can have pulmonary arterial hypertension, and they may have very little in the way of neurological abnormalities. And there's a late onset, which can have sudden cognitive decline, confusion, dementia, ataxia, peripheral neuropathy, usually milder hematological abnormalities. And there have been some patients who presented only with psychosis. When you look at cultured cells, they have decreased synthesis of both the cofactors and decreased incorporation of both propionate and methyl tetrahydrofolate. But, the but they have less B12 in um, uh, accumulated. So if you incubate the cells in labeled vitamin B12, they accumulate less B12 as opposed to the patients with cabalamin F and cabalamin J, which accumulate more B12. So it seems that if cells after coming out of the lysosome can't bind to MACHC, the B12 gets out of the cell. Now, there are over 110 different mutations that have been identified. In Europe, the most common mutation is the 221, 271 dupe A, but by far the most common mutation is in China, the C609G to A. And um, there are huge series now coming out of China of patients with uh, cabalamin C. 
There are other um, specific ethnic group uh, uh, mutations, and mutations are common uh, to uh, other ethnic groups, particularly this one from France that made her way to North America and is found in French Canada and in uh, Louisiana. Now, after sequencing hundreds of patients um, and finding the causal mutations in MACHC, there were several patients in which either no mutations uh, were found or um, a single mutation was found. But we uh, were particularly uh, uh, interested at one point for the patients where there was not um, a second mutation found. And it was found that there was no expression of the second allele, the one that didn't have the MACC mutation. And there was hypermethylation of the MAC promoter in three patients. And no sequence variant was identified in the promoter region. Dr. Jean-Louis Guéant at uh, Lorraine, and he'll be speaking uh, a little bit later, used a whole genome se sequencing and found that these patients had a specific mutation in, in the gene PRDX1 that resulted in the loss of the last exon of the gene and no polyadenylation signal. Mutations resulted in a long PRDX1 message that spanned the entire MACHC gene and its promoter. This led to methylation of the MACHC promoter and no MMACHC expression. Next, we had many patients that had mutations in MACHC who had the cellular phenotype and actually fit into the Kalmolin C complementation group, but we couldn't find any mutation at all. One of these patients uh, was referred originally by Johan van Hoven at the University of Denver. And he had Tamin Sheikh's lab do a uh, whole exome sequencing and surprisingly found a mutation in the HCFC1 gene on the X chromosome. Now, mutations in HCFC1 were subsequently identified in 10 of the 11 remaining lines without mutations, and there are 18 currently known. Now, HCFC1 is a transcriptional co-regulator that affects the expression of a number of genes, including MMACHC. It partners genes such as FAP11 or ZNF143 to exert an effect on DNA expression. Importantly, all the HCFC1 mutations that were phenocopies of Cobalamin C had mutations that affected a single domain of HCFC1, the Kelsch domain. Later on, there have been other patients involved that had uh, mutations in HCFC1 outside this domain. They tend not to have any vitamin B12 uh, phenotype. Cobalamin X mutations affect expression for only a few of the many genes regulated by HCFC1 and its partners. And we still don't know why this disorder um, uh, doesn't complement the Cobalamin C disorder, because you would expect that the cell line that has uh, uh, the Cobalamin C and may CHC mutation would have a functional HCFC1 gene. Now, the phenotype is not quite typical of the Cobalamin C. The metabolic phenotype is rather mild, but the neurological phenotype is quite severe with intractable seizures and severe intellectual impairment. Subsequently, a single patient was found in FAP11. FAP11 is a transcriptional regulator that interacts with HCFC1. Homozygous mutations were identified in a patient with a Cobalamin C diagnosis, but no MAC or HCFC1 mutations. And the phenotype is the same as Cobalamin X patients. And again, in complementation analysis, these patients do not complement Cobalamin C lines, presumably because there's no expression of MACHC. The one known mutation, because the family was consanguineous, is this F. 8080L or the C240C to T. Subsequently, a single patient was found with a mutation in ZNF143. Uh, this patient had accumulation of TCCBL in the lysosome. Now, ZNF143 is a transcriptional regulator that can interact with HCFC1 and FAP11, resulting in decreased transcription of MACHC. But clearly, something else is happening. 
So all those uh, transcription factor mutations that I just described about, and mutations in MACHC and the PRDX1 mutation affect MACHC. So MACHC has to hand off the B12 to MADHC, which plays a role in directing cobalamin either to the cytoplasm, where it is required by methionine synthase, or to the mitochondrion, where it's required by methylmalocoa mutase. So MADHC binds to MACHC. MADCHC has been shown by Ruben Banerjee's lab to bind cobalamin, although it originally was thought not to. MADHC is, presented, is present in both the cytoplasm and the mitochondria, where MACHC is present only in the cytoplasm. So there you have MADHC, if you want, um, shunting the B12 either to the cytoplasm uh, for uh, generation of methyl B12 or to the mitochondria for the generation of adenosyl B12. Now, uh, originally in 1972, brothers were described with combined methylmalonic aciduria and homocystinuria. They had the same cellular phenotype as cobalamin C, but complementation analysis showed that the defects were, were different and it was given the name cobalamin D, and that work was originally done in the Leon Rosenberg lab. For 35 years, no additional patients were reported. Then the group in Switzerland demonstrated that there were other cobalamin C patients out there, but they didn't look like the original patients. Some patients had only methylmalonic aciduria and no homocystinuria. Some patients had only homocystinuria and no methylmalonic aciduria. And the hypothesis was the gene includes the mitochondrial targeting sequences and two potential alternate start sites. In the type that causes methylmalonic aciduria, mutations at the five prime terminal end of the gene before an alternative start codon, there was no mitochondrial targeting sequence produced, but an alternative protein, the cytoplasmic function was produced by reinitiation of translation of one of the alternate start codons. In the cobalamin D homocysteine phenotype, mutations at the three prime terminal end of the gene produce a protein with the mitochondrial targeting sequences and, and mitochondrial function lacking cytoplasmic function. And the cobalamin D combined had nonsense mutations that resulted in no protein production and neither cytoplasmic nor mitochondrial function. So there you have a schema of it with um, where the mutations are along the path of the gene. So far, 27 patients with the cobalamin D type have been found, 10 of the classic with combined homocystinuria, methylmalonic aciduria, eight with isolated homocystinuria, and nine with methylmalonic aciduria. Now we come to the patients that only have homocystinuria and no methylmalonic aciduria. And of course, these will affect uh, methionine synthase, the uh, enzyme that converts homocysteine to methionine, this uh, enzyme is interesting, it requires three methyl donors, methyl tetrahydrofolate, methyl B12, and methylcobalamin. It's encoded by the gene MTR. And it requires a second protein, methionine synthase reductase, to function the product of MTRR. When cobalamin binds to methionine synthase, it cycles between cobalamin 1 alumin and methylcobalamin. And every few hundred catalytic cycles, the cobalamin spontaneously oxidizes to cobalamin 2 alumin. Methionine synthase reductase is then required to generate methylcobalamin. So those are your three forms of isolated homocysteinuria, the cobalamin D homocysteine variant, cobalamin E, and cobalamin G. Megaloblastic anemia is common, along with cerebral atrophy, microcephaly, nystagmus, hepatonia, hypertonia, and intellectual impairment. The first patient had normal methionine synthase activity when we assayed in vitro under standard conditions, but when you made reducing conditions uh, suboptimal, they found to have deficient activity. And we found subsequently there were two complementation classes, the cobalamin E, which had decreased activity of methionine synthase in the presence of suboptimal reducing conditions, and cobalamin G that always had reduced activity of methionine synthase. Now, in E. coli, there's a two-component system required to maintain cobalamin and methionine synthase in its active form, but this does not exist in human cells. There was only a single complementation class identified with a presumed deficiency in this reduction system, and that was the cobalamin E class, which really was the first demonstration of 
this activity in mammalian cells. So far, there have been around 35 families reported, about 30 mutations. And the most common mutation is one that's not easy to find because it uh, results in the incorporation of an intronic uh, sequence. Cabalamin G is caused by mutations in the gene encoding the thionine synthase itself, the MTR gene, which was found almost simultaneously by groups uh, in, the, in Nebraska, Montreal, and, and, and Berkeley. And uh, to date, around 50 mutations have been identified in this gene. So that's the, the story I want to tell you today. Um, it's a very complicated system. And the next couple of talks, you're going to hear um, some much more refinement and some advances uh, in the therapeutics as well. So I thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, giving this introduction this morning. Good morning, Dr. Rosenblatt. How are you? Good morning. Nice to see you, Jennifer. Nice to see you as well. Thank you so much for that wonderful overview of the very complicated cabalamin pathway. We really appreciate that. Um, I don't see any uh, questions yet in the chat. So I had a few questions myself for you. Um, one was uh, whether or not you think there are more cobalamin disorders to be identified. We're just wondering sort of how many patients are still unknown out there. Well, I'm always surprised. Um, for decades, I've been writing grants, grants and reviewers say, I don't know why you're studying this because the pathway is completely known. And then another patient comes up uh, that um, teaches us something else. And uh, while I, I love and respect um, animal models, I think that the patients are really very important and the families that are there, your participation and you're going to um, referral centers and then getting involved and being generous enough to give material. Everything that we do has been done on cells from patients, so it's all been done uh, remotely. But uh, certainly the very early steps um, after the um, B12 uh, comes um, is endocytose. I think there's still things that have to be uh, learned. And uh, that's witnessed more by the ZNF 143, but I think there are other things that we really don't know what the early steps. And certainly when we come to regulation and transcription factors, I think there's still a lot that we, we need to know. And most interesting, um, I think that's coming up with these transcription factors is um, if there are pathogenic variants um, outside domains that affect B12 metabolism, are there moonlighting functions of all these genes? And this can be say almost generally with a lot of the inborn errors, we always um, ascribe much of the phenotype to the metabolic effect. But could these proteins be having off-site moonlighting functions that affect some of the secondary clinical findings. I was thinking of that yesterday and listening to all the things in the propionic acidemia pathway where we think where the metabolites look high and the patients are okay and vice versa, the metabolites aren't so high and the patients don't look okay. So I think we do have a lot yet to learn. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. Uh, there's a few questions in the um, Q&A now. Um, somebody was asking for the new genes and types of defects identified when there are a VUS and a biochemical phenotype, is complementation studies necessary or helpful any, any way? So could you comment on sort of the role of uh, fibroblast studies in, in the genomic era? Yeah, and uh, we used to get something like 100 uh, samples a year to analyze, and now we're getting something around 10 or less, but everyone is almost turns into a study on itself. Um, often, if you have um, two pathogenic variants, I think it's fairly clear. Um, if you have one pathogenic variant and a variant of unknown significance, but you have a patient with a clinical phenotype that is clear, I think it is okay. But I really, really um, hesitate on ascribing um, a diagnosis to patients with an unclear phenotype or um, I've seen patients said to have synergistic heterozygosity because they're doubly heterozygous, mm -hmm. where in mm -hmm. fact they really have a classic disease, but the second mutation isn't easily found. So I think there's still a role, if not for complementation, um, certainly for things like propionate uptake, which is easier to do, to see if there's a functional defect in the pathway at the cellular level. So I think people can you know, ask for that without doing full complementation, because if you have um, a phenotype 
uh, that fits and you have one variant and then say the propionate is low or the B12 distribution fits, you can be really confident. And if you want to go further as a research question, you can do it. But from a clinical point of view, I think it's nice to have the functional assay to back up the unusual patients. And for us, it's been fascinating because we're finding things that we didn't expect uh, to find. Yeah, I completely agree. They're very, very useful studies to know really the, the biochemistry um, in, in the patient cells. But one of, other question, can you discuss how the metabolic profiles of the different patients relate to the phenotype? Specifically, why do the downstream mutations seem more severe? I've wondered this uh, all the time, or why the upstream mutations are not uh, severe, or even when they are severe, like the transcobalamin uh, uh, deficiency, which can be very severe and present mm -hmm. neonatally. And if you miss it, you know, some of those patients have had bone marrow transplant or misdiagnosis as, as, as leukemia, but they're easily treatable. So that's, um, again, and I'm wondering whether there are off target sites of some of these proteins that affect uh, uh, some of that. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rosenblatt. Really appreciate you being here today. See you at the discussion at the end of the day. Yes, thanks for joining the panel. And I think we're gonna move on to the next speaker. And the next speaker is Dr. Manoli, who's from our group at NHGRI. She's a clinician associate investigator and um, she has been really a driving force in our clinical efforts here to document the natural history of MMA and cabalamin disorders and has a number of impactful publications regarding pathophysiology, new biomarkers and dietary management. And today she's going to discuss cabalamin C deficiency and high dose B12 therapy. Thank you so much, Irene. We'll see you in a, after your talk. Thank you for joining us. It is an honor to follow Dr. Rosenblatt today, a pioneer in the research in intracellular B12 metabolism uh, in bone errors, to discuss the clinical management of cobalamin C deficiency. I have nothing to disclose. I will review the evolution of vitamin B12 and dietary therapy for patients with cobalamin C and discuss the impact of inborn screening on disease outcomes. Cobalamin C is the most common inborn errors of intracellular B12 metabolism. Pathway, it's caused by pathogenic variants in the gene MMACHC that codes for the protein necessary for the processing and trafficking of vitamin B12 through MMADHC to its two active uh, cofactors, 5 deoxyadenosyl cobalamin, that is the cofactor of the methylmalonicoid mutase reaction in the mitochondria, and the methylcobalamin, that is the cofactor for methionine synthase in the cytoplasm. The defect in those two uh, metabolic enzymes result in the classic disease biochemistry, elevated and then methylmalonic acid, and homocysteine, and reduced synthesis of methionine. For the treatment of the children, we use hydroxycobalamin intramuscular or subcutaneous injections, one milligram per day. In addition, betaine and folinic acid are used to aid with other metal transferase reactions uh, in a one carbon uh, methylation cycle. Of note, cyanocobalamin is contraindicated for the disorder because the cyanide ligand needs to be removed by a functional MMACHC protein. Cobalamin C is a multi organ disorder. Multiple systems are affected, but primarily the central nervous system and the eyes. The children can present with microcephaly, hydrocephalus, seizures, intellectual impairment, and uh, develop uh, progressive and early onset characteristic degeneration of the macula, the part of the retina responsible for central vision, resulting in uh, uh, starting in early infancy and resulting in severe vision loss. Manifestations can start in utero. Uh, children can have intrauterine growth retardation, microcephaly, macular coloboma, or congenital heart defects, highlighting the need for early intervention and therapy, uh, even prenatally as illustrated by successful treatment uh, of uh, affected siblings with uh, hydrox hydroxycobalamin in pregnant mothers. In our natural history protocol since 2004, we able, have been able to enroll 54 patients with early onset cobalamin C. About 50% of our patients were detected by newborn screening or with prenatal testing through family screening. 
And again, 50% of a cohort uh, are homozygous for the severe early onset European variant C271 to A. Being able to enroll patients from a number of national and international centers allows us to appreciate the variability of treatment approaches and correlate with uh, different disease outcomes. As you can see, we have uh, uh, variable management uh, with B12 and frequency of dosing with B12, uh, uh, different doses of betaine, a number of other supplements, and 40% uh, of the cohort were receiving medical foods designed for methylmalonic and propionic acidemia. The dose of B12 uh, of one milligram per day corresponds to a 0.3 milligram per kilogram per day in infancy, but uh, as the patients uh, get older, and with less frequent dosing, this dose is uh, even less, uh, 0 0.005 to 0 0.001 milligram per kilogram per day in teens and young adults, resulting in worsening of the metabolic control and uh, very elevated levels of homocysteine over 100 in a number of patients. This triggered us to look into improving uh, biochemistry with increasing the dose of vitamin B12 prompted by previous reports with intravenous uh, use of high doses in, in the setting of hemolytic uremic syndrome that took a Hove at all. We, many years ago, we performed a dose escalation study in a single young adult uh, from one milligram to 10 and 20 milligram per day. And we're able to observe a, a nice response in the total homocysteine and serum MMA from uh, over 100 to in around the 40 micromole per liter range and an improvement in methylene. This was quickly adopted by many clinics and uh, the families who had access to compounded uh, hydroxycobalamin uh, and es escalating the doses to 0.3 milligram per kilogram per day as the patients get older to achieve a better biochemical control and keeping homocysteine levels in around 40 to 60 range. The doses were up to 2.7 milligram per kilogram per day usually 25 to 30 milligrams of hydroxycobalamin per day. Despite the biochemical improvement, there was questionable clinical benefit because the, we cannot reverse the visual and cognitive impairments. Uh, and uh, the other issue is that uh, uh, there is very limited access to compounded P12 uh, and it's not uh, regulated and not approved by insurances resulting in high costs for the families. It was not until we started seeing patients with, uh, who were able to escalate the doses in younger ages, between six months and four years, that we started seeing uh, improvement in neurocognitive outcomes with higher B12 uh, doses, and uh, showing here by England adaptive behavior composite scores in a number of uh, presymptomatically detected younger children. The other aspect of the management of copalamin C is the dietary therapy. Uh, we use hydroxycobalamin and betaine to improve methionine synthesis, but on the other hand, we use protein restriction and MMA or PA uh, special, special formulas to reduce the methionine acid uh, level for the MMA part of the pathway. These special formulas have uh, no uh, methionine because they have no valine solution methionine and threonine that make MMA, but they also have high levels of leucine that competes for the methionine transport through the shared transporters, like the large neutral amino acid transporter, resulting in low uptake of methionine in the CMS. In that dietary work, we were able to show that higher leucine of the methionine intake and plasma concentrations correspond to lower predicted methionine uptake with the CMS and smaller head circumferences in the children. This was later replicated by another group uh, with of newborn screening children at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who again showed that higher intake of incomplete protein through the, the formulas resulted in smaller head circumferences. And uh, combined, it suggested that those special formulas are contraindicated in cobalamin C deficiency. And here we are able to now appreciate a significant improvement in neurocognitive outcomes in newborn detected patients when we have patients with high dose B12 or in no medical foods, as opposed to our uh, historic cohort with symptomatic presentations who have a mean uh, neurocognitive score of about 60 uh, and 
the Muslim patients from the Mount Sinai cohort and our, all our presymptomatic detected patients have no significant difference from the historic controls, but it's only with a high dose and the avoidance of medical foods that the immunocognitive outcome is significantly improved to close to 80, uh, which is, of course, a significant improvement for the patients and their families. In a multivariate regression, the main components affecting neurocognitive uh, outcomes is the head circumference and epilepsy with a smaller impact of the natural protein intake. The symptomatic diagnosis is also associated with uh, improved head growth in the uh, patients and also with a lower incidence of epilepsy. We can appreciate here that uh, symptomatic presenting patients uh, have uh, increased incidence and in earlier months of uh, seizures than our symptomatic level. What is an open question is whether these higher doses starting even earlier in infancy could uh, ameliorate or delay the progression of the uh, aculopathy in cobalamin C. It's very intriguing and uh, an encouraging study by Scalet et al. Uh, used uh, ultra high doses of uh, IV hydroxycobalamin and then uh, subcutaneous in three symptomatic infants, homozygous for the C to 71 to A variant. Uh, up to 5.5 mg per kilogram per day, and we're able to show normal biochemistry, good neurocognitive outcome, and mild visual impairments in this severe phenotype children at around three and a half years of age. We were able to evaluate one patient and that was 5 mg per day since the first month of life, and at age three and a half, uh, we uh, show a uh, Normal thickness of the macula. This is an optical coherence tomography in the area of the macula. Uh, in this uh, patient, compared to a, a patient treated with standard therapy of one milligram per day, that shows significant atrophy in the in the macula in, in OCD. And this patient had normal vision and uh, good neurocognitive outcome at three and a half years of age. Again, uh, unusual for this very severe genotype. In conclusion, presymptomatic diagnosis coupled with optimized therapy can improve outcomes in compilement C deficiency. Our newborn screening and, and treatments need to be unified so that we detect the children early and uh, uh, improve their overall uh, outcome. And more basic research and clinical trials are needed to study if these early and higher doses of B12 could ameliorate uh, the cobalamin C eye disease, uh, examine if it, the safety, and help obtain regulatory control so that all families can have access to, to the medication. And our group, uh, as Dr. Venditti discussed yesterday, we work uh, on gene therapy development for all uh, different defects in our pathways, uh, in, including cobalamin C. And we have an AV9 gene therapy for either systemic or subretinal delivery uh, for, for CBLC, uh, and um, are able to show that uh, our gene therapy uh, treated mice are rescued uh, or, or high prenatal and postnatal hydroxycobalamin treated mice are both rescued from early neonatal lethality in, in, in the mouse model. A combination of AV and hydroxycobalamin results in even better outcomes. And uh, we work to uh, verify these results in the, for the eye disease in a, a different model because these mice don't develop the eye disease at this point. And with that, I want to thank uh, many uh, colleagues that have contributed to this work, and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Manoli. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. It's great to see some work on um, cobalamin C, one of my favorite diseases. Um, we have a few questions here. The first question is, have you observed any long-term problems with the high-dose B12 in cobalamin C patients? So you can hear me well, right? Uh, so. We have now, with this escalating of the dose in the teens and adults, we have now over, we say, 80 years, patient years experience with high dose daily uh, hydroxycobalamin in older uh, uh, people with cobalamin C, and we have not observed uh, side effects. Now, if the question is for this ultra high dose in the very young babies, that is uh, 
pilot it in a study in uh, Europe by Escalet et al. in Belgium. This is the one report of only three patients did not uh, report any uh, side effects with this ultra high dose, but this is very early to say. Uh, it's not widely uh, used and uh, the safety has to be established in that trial and follow-up trials. Thank, thank you so much. Um, another question is, um, the, the, you know, the B12 compounding is not available any everywhere yeah. and um, sort of, can it become an orphan medication? What do you think, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, we, we're working on that and I know uh, our colleagues in Europe are also trying to find ways to uh, uh, produce it in a regulated way so that it's safely made and uh, uh, distributed in a uniform fashion and ob obtain to the, the work required to obtain regulatory approval so that it is available to cover for insurances and available to patients if it is established that it is the way to go and that it is indeed helping with um, you know both neurocognitive outcomes and maybe uh, the eye disease. It's still we need more studies for all of this <laughs> and eventually yes approval and access to to the patients there was a question here about um pregnancy and treatment of in utero um, fetuses affected with cobalamin c um the person is wondering how early to start the the treatment and is there any long-term data on prenatal treatment this is again very isolated case reports and uh, there are reports uh, using different doses of B12 uh, showing progression of the disease despite prenatal therapy or no successful outcome with higher doses up to 30 milligram a week, 10 milligram three times a week starting around 15 weeks of pregnancy I believe in that one report that should significantly improve the outcome in the second sibling compared to the originally symptomatically presenting uh, uh, affected patient. So there is no standardized regimen, but uh, again, it seems like higher doses are required to have a better outcome. This is a disease we need to treat in utero. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, may, eventually, if we had a gene therapy <laughs> delivered in utero, the manifestations start very early and the therapeutic window is very small at, after birth. The first few months, I think we, we need to newborn screen, detect early, and treat uniformly so that we try to improve the eventual uh, outcome. That leads me to my final question, which is in the, your linear regression, you noted that the pre-symptomatic diagnosis, the B12, and so having more of a normal methionine correlated with a, a much better um, IQ. And I was wondering if you could comment on which of those three things you think might be most important for you know, the op optimization of the neurological outcomes in cobalamin C. Uh, I think the early diagnosis is key, as, as we said, with the utero uh, experience and the early progression of the eye findings. We don't have nystagmus by first month, second month, mm -hmm. have retinal findings in the first three, four months of age. So uh, intervention has to occur very early. Uh, and in our experience, we started seeing the pre-symptomatic cases, then uh, removing the medical foods that reduce the methionine uptake and uh, cause low methionines and impacted brain development. That came second. So I think newborn screening and no medical food use already improved the children outcomes significantly. The added benefit of escalating or super high B12 dosing, this is a open question. and. Uh, it's hard to tell from our data because we don't have that many patients that were on high doses very early on. Um, but it is an intriguing report uh, by the Scalet et al. We saw this one case with five milligram uh, very early that had a very much improved uh, eye findings compared to our traditional patients. So we strongly feel that we need to address this and answer that for the families. Is that is there a window that we could, with whatever we have now available, intervene and improve the, the outcome of the disease? All right, thank you so much. I, yes, I, I hope that we can really improve you know, the treatment for these children. Um, thank you so much for your work. So I'm gonna introduce the next 
speaker, which is Dr. Poche, who is an associate professor of molecular physiology and biophysics at Baylor College of Medicine. His lab utilizes mouse genetics and molecular biology to answer fundamental questions regarding transcriptional and epigenetic regulation of mammalian development and tissue regeneration. And today he's going to present his exciting work on a number of mouse models he's developed for uh, Cabalamin X, Ronin, and Cabalamin C. Thank you, Dr. Pache. One. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to speak here today. Um, I first want to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation. And I'm really excited because this is my first time speaking on, on this topic uh, publicly. Um, so hopefully you like what I have to say. Um, so a few years uh, ago, my lab started a project where we began to make mouse models of CBLC and CBLX. And today I'm just going to tell you about some of the, the strange things and that we've been learning about these mice. Um, and I'm really uh, looking forward to getting your opinion. Um, first, let me say that I have nothing to disclose and give you a little bit of the history of this project. So the reason we started working on CBLC and CBLX is because my lab has been work working on a transcription factor named Ronin for quite some time now. And Ronin is a zinc finger transcription factor. And its first described role is as an embryonic stem cell pluripotency factor. And we now know that it's part of a large chromatin remodeling complex. It both positively and negatively regulates genes. And importantly for this talk, it absolutely requires the transcription cofactor HEFG1, otherwise it can't uh, transactivate as target genes. So my lab uh, a few years ago knocked out Ronin in the developing retina. We are a retinal biology lab historically. And what we found in the retina was that when we knocked for now during retinal development, the adult retinas became degenerative. And it's a very unusual type of retinal degener degeneration whereby we saw these patchy lesions in the retina. So these lesions, um, are actually holes in the photoreceptor layer. Um, and this is not common. Typically, there's uniform degeneration throughout the retina when rods and cones die. So it's a very unique phenotype, but we still don't really understand what target genes are responsible for this defect. So long story short, my lab published a paper uh, back in 2016 showing that Ronin directly regulates a large cohort of mitochondrial genes. We initially these genes were driving the retinal phenotype. However, over the course of doing the analysis and, and, and digging through this, this list of, of target genes, we noticed that the gene MMACHC was one of our top hits and it annotated it as a mitochondrial gene um, in, in the databases. So here I'm just showing you um, Ronin chip seek peak, as well as the qPCR validation um, showing the transcript is dramatically reduced in our Ronin mutant retinas. So this gene is really interesting to us because we began looking into it further and we, know, we found out that the genes actually mutated, and of course all of you know this, in a syndrome uh, called methylmonic aciduria and homocystinuria type C, which is a cabalamin deficiency uh, disorder. And interestingly, these patients with, with this disease um, do have a retinopathy that's been described as a trophic lacuna, where there's, there's holes actually in the retina, um, not too far from the optic nerve. Um, and what what we couldn't help but wonder is, well, are these, these holes, these atrophic lacuna, similar to the lesions that we saw in the Ronin condition on our retina? Maybe this is because this is the key target gene that's actually driving this retinal phenotype. So we became more convinced of this and very interested when we found a report of a patient, uh, or patients, I should say, with mutation in, in HCFC1 um, that had the syndrome very similar to CBLC. And then uh, after our paper was published, we found an additional report um, of actually one patient with mutation and Ronin itself, again, with the CBLC-like syndrome. So this made a lot of sense to us because we knew that Ronin and HCF should one with direct transcriptional uh, regulators of MMACHC, and now we had this, this data to confirm that there's some, some uh, implication in vivo. So it's clearly a really important target gene. So what does it do? So as you all probably know, um, it encodes an enzyme uh, that's important for vitamin B12 or cabalamin metabolism. And it's thought to promote the processing and transport of inactive B12 uh, into two uh, active coenzyme forms. One functions in the cell plasma with MTR to convert homocysteine to methionine. The other one is in the mitochondria where it functions with MUT to convert methylmonic coa to succinyl coa that feeds into the TCA cycle. So disruption or mutation in MMACHC results in the disease methylmonic aciduria and homocystinuria. 
And we know that, that this is because we have a reduction of these B12 coenzymes, and that leads to a deficiency in MTR and MBT activity. And then the consequence of that is the buildup of the upstream metabolites, homocysteine and MMA, and then the methionine deficiency. So clinically, these patients present with a variety of developmental disorders. I mean, you do see injury and growth restriction, but really predominantly, you see a lot of neural developmental problems. So these patients have intractable epilepsy as well as other uh, defects in their development. You also see anemia, kidney, some heart defects, and of course, the retinal degeneration I was just telling you about. So um, what about CBLX syndrome? Well, obviously we know that part of the syndrome is due to deregulation of MMACHD expression and the consequences on the cobalamin pathway. But we, have, we can't ignore the fact these are transcription factors, and there's probably many other target genes that contribute to the pathophysiology of CBLX. And in fact, clinically, many of the papers describing uh, these patients um, state that the syndrome is more severe than, than classical CBLC. So my lab is really interested in, in, in this uh, disease because we think that these hypomorphic mutations, they're, they're likely hypomorphic mutations, in HCF-C1 and Ronin uh, may shed some light on their role during development. Um, just, just, for your, uh, just to let you know, when you knock out Ronin or HCF-C1 in the mouse uh, in a germline fashion, um, you get a pre-implantation lethal. So it's a very early lethal. So these are probably hypomorphic mutations, right? Um, we also really want to understand more about the pathophysiology of CBOX in the context of RONA and HCFC1 loss of function. And then, of course, it raises a really interesting question, which are the MMACHC dependent versus independent phenotypes? So to address some of these questions, my lab made some mouse models. So we started off with um, an HCFC1 point mutation, which is one of the co more common mutations observed in the patients. And it's a silly mutation. It's alanine to valine substitution. It's in a conserved residue within the kelch protein protein interaction domain of HCFC1. So these mice um, are actually sub-viral. So about half of them are, are dead by weaning. Um, we don't know what's, what's killing them yet, um, but we'll, we'll touch upon that later. Uh, the other most model is the Ronin point mutation. This is a homozygous mutation. It's a, phen a phenylalanine to leucine substitution, again, in a conserved residue, and this mutation is in the DNA binding domain or, or tap domain of Ronin. Uh, these mice are more severe, as you might expect based on this mutation, and they actually die at birth uh, due to an inability to breathe. Um, we don't quite yet know why that's the case, but, but again, I'll touch upon that later. Okay, so the first question was, do these mouse models um, exhibit loss or reduce MMACUC expression as they should? And the answer is yes. So here I'm showing you an example from the Ronin FNDL mice, where we show a chromatin, PC, a chromatin um, IP PCR experiment, where we can show you that Ronin binding to the MMACUC promoter is, is gone. And we see that the transcripts for MMACHC is reduced in the brains from both mutants. And we also see the protein is also reduced, so as all is expected. So of course, the next question is, is the development pathway disrupted? And I'm just going to summarize these data for lack of time. Um, so yes, the answer is we, we do recapitulate what you'd expect to see in the Kabbalah disorder. Um, both uh, mutants have reduced uh, Kabbalah and coenzymes. Um, they also have reduced MET and MTR activity. They also have uh, increased MMA and homocysteine levels in their serum. Pathologically, they also exhibit features common to, to CBLC patients, such as this intrauterine growth restriction, as well as some neural developmental problems, anemia, and heart ventricular non-compaction. So this is all expected, and, and I should mention this was done in a, in a, a very, uh, a very uh, nice collaboration with David Rosenblatt's lab. Um, but we found something else in these mice that, were a bit, that was a bit unexpected initially. And what we found was that some of our HCFC1 mice had this very unusual curvature of the, of the snout and also this flat facial profile. And this is actually really intriguing to us because we found one report of patients, two brothers, that have similar craniofacial features. Um, so you can see this asymmetry in this flat facial profile. So we thought that this dysmorphia was, was really intriguing. And we did some measurements um, some of surface area length and width of all the craniofacial bones. And what we found was that both neural crest derived components, as well as some of the mesoderm derived components, were affected in these mice. But maybe primarily more neural crest uh, uh, was affected. But this suggested to us that there's, that there's a role for HCFC1 in, in craniofacial development. 
So the next question was, well, does Ronan have a role in creating facial development? So to address that, we first uh, did intercrosses between the Ronin and HCFC1 mutant mice. Here I'm showing you some, a double head that does indeed have this, this craniofacial asymmetry. Um, and we also know that Ronin and HCFC1 co-IP in the neural crest cell line. So they're very likely uh, cooperating uh, during craniofacial development. We also looked at the FADL homozygous mice, and we noticed that there was reduced ossification in both the mesoderm and the neural crest derived components. So here I'm showing you both. Um, since these mice are runted, um, we thought, well, maybe we should make sure this isn't a, develop a developmental delay phenotype. So to address that possibility, we began to do conditional lockouts. So we did one um, of the mesoderm component using the PRX1 Cree. And as you can see, we're again losing the ossification of the mesoderm-derived craniofacial skeleton. And then we went ahead and did the neural crest knockout using a wet one Cree. And we saw this dramatic uh, agenesis of the, of the craniofacial skeleton that's neural crest-derived. So you can see all of the, the neural crest derivatives are, are gone uh, in these mutants. So clearly both Ronin and HCFC1 have a really important role in both the mesoderm and neural crest-derived craniofacial skeleton development. Okay, so of course the next question was, well, does this have anything to do with, with MMACHC and Kabbalah metabolism? So we wanted to really test if, if you know, this is due to loss of MMACHC expression. So to address that, we made a transgenic mouse that expresses MMACHC ubiquitously. Here it is showing you the, the spatial expression. Um, here's the RNA showing a dramatic increase in transcript as well as the protein. So our idea was to cross this mouse to both the Ronin conditional knockout as well as the HGF C1 point mutation. So a severe defect and a, and a subtle defect and see does it rescue these phenotypes. But before we did that, we first wanted to make sure that the transgene is functional. So we actually crossed it to the MACHC uh, null mice which are embryonic lethal by E15.5. You see this is an embryo that's actually being resorbed as it's already dead. Um, so can the transgene rescue the, the germline mutation for MMACHC? And the answer is yes. So it completely rescues the lethality of these mice. Here I'm showing you homozygous mutants that carry the transgene. And as you can see, they're at Mendelian ratio. So our transgene, as far as the lethality in these early developmental phenotypes is concerned, is fully functional. So now we went ahead and crossed it to the Ronin conditional knockouts. And we found that it doesn't rescue this phenotype. So here I'm showing you a conditional knockout carrying the transgenes, and then 100% of those show the same craniofacial agenesis that we saw for the conditional knockouts not carrying the transgene. So we next crossed the transgene to the HCFC1 mutants. And interestingly, we saw that indeed we were able to rescue the serum levels of MMA and, and homocysteine almost to wild type levels. Um, but despite this rescue of this metabolic uh, disorder, we did not see an improvement in the, the survivability of these mice. They're still sublethal despite carrying the transgene. We also did not rescue the craniofacial phenotype. You can see here, I'm showing you some of the nasal and frontal bone data. We do not improve at all the, the changes in, in the skeleton. So this tells us that while we were able to rescue the cabalamin defect, it looks like, we're not able to rescue other phenotypes that might be cabalamin independent. So, of course, the, the better proof for this uh, versus a replacement transgene is to actually knock out MMACHC in the neural crest to see does it phenocopy the Ronin conditional knockout. Because if it was playing a role there, downstream of Ronin, you should get a similar phenotype. So, to do that, we made a flux allele of MMACHC that deletes exons two to four. And we took this mouse and crossed it to the wet one Cree to generate this neural crest knockout. And we got a really good knockout, but despite that, we saw no craniofacial phenotypes whatsoever. So both here at 11.5 and 14.5, we can see normal looking face in these mice. So we think that, that these data in total tell us that MMACAC does not contribute to the Ronin or HCFC1 mutant craniofacial phenotypes. So that would suggest that other Ronin target genes are involved here. So of course now our task was to fish these out. So we performed um, embryonic brain RNA seq from the Ronin uh, homozygous mutants, as well as uh, Ronin chip seq from from wild type brains at the same stage. 
and on the RNA level. So the RNA seq showed us that that we did pick up a, a down regulation of many of the mitochondrial genes that we previously found in our retina study. In addition to that, we found that our top hit was a category um, of ribosome uh, proteins. Uh, and what these actually are is the ribosome protein subunits, so the genes encoding those. So we hit quite, quite, uh, quite many of them. So about 50% of the ribosome proteins encoded by the genome are down-regulated, and it's both the cytoplasmic as well as the mitochondrial ribosome proteins. So I'm showing you all the ones in blue that are transcriptionally down-regulated in our mutant brains. So of course, we now need to show whether or not these are direct or indirect targets of Ronin. So to do that, we took our ChIP-seq data, overlaid it with the RNA-seq data, and once again, um, structural constituent of the ribosome was our top hit. So these are direct target genes of Ronin that encode ribosomal uh, subunits. Here I'm just showing you some chip seq peaks from different subunits, as well as the QRTP serve validation, showing you that they're all significantly, but they're fairly subtly downregulated, but on a broad scale. So many of them are, are just globally reduced. Okay. okay, so to us, this raises a really interesting question. So is CBLX both a development disorder and a ribosomopathy? So if, if it were a ribosomopathy, we would expect a defect in translation, right? So the first thing we did um, was looking at both brain tissue as well as fibroblasts derived from the FADL homozygous mice. We performed pyromycin labeling, which is an indirect readout of, of protein translation. And what we actually found was that the pyromycin labeling was increased in both the brains and the maps from the mutant mice. This was somewhat unexpected. Um, but this is a snapshot of translation at that given time. Um, we also performed polysome profiling. And once again, we saw indication that would suggest an increase in translation because the FDL mice shown here in this red trace have more polysomes than the wild type mice. And you can see this is better illustrated with the polysome to ADS ratio. So the ADS is reduced in, in the uh, homozygous mutants because it's making more polysomes. So there's more ribosomes bound to RNA. In these, in these mice. And this is from a uh, mass and brain tissue. We did this. We did one more experiment to look at translation. We performed a global protein mass spec from uh, Ronan FNL brains and, and as well as mass. So here I'm showing you the math data. Um, and we actually did, of course, see that protein biosynthesis and ribosome biogenesis were, were increased uh, in, in these mutants. Um, so again, it's sort of counterintuitive that we're getting transcriptionally a reduction in ribosome protein, uh, protein uh, of genes encoding ribosome proteins, yet an increase in translation and ribosome biogenesis. So is this apparent increase in translation, if it really is a true increase, um, still defective? Well, some evidence for that comes from uh, uh, these data where we looked at the FNEL homozygous brains um, for ubiquitination, and we see a global increase in protein ubiquitination. Um, in retrospect, this wasn't that surprising because the unfolded uh, uh, protein response came up in our mass spec data. So this would suggest that, that whatever proteins are being made by these mutants, they're either aberrant or they're in excess, and the cells are trying to deal with proteotoxic stress as a consequence of that. We also noticed that, that serum amino acid levels were, were, were heavily reduced, uh, increased uh, uh, in these mutants. So you can see the ones shaded in blue are all amino acids that are elevated in the serum of the HCFC1 mice. So, this, so again, we're seeing a similar thing. It's an indication that maybe proteins are being degraded uh, in, in these mice. Okay, so one of the big questions, so we don't quite know what's wrong with translation right yet, but is this increase in translation, is it causing a pathology? And you know, there's, there's a lot of literature now to suggest that mutations in different ribosome protein subunits give very distinct phenotypes depending on which one is mutated. For example, RPL38 is a ribosome protein and mutations give rise to homeotic transformations. But you don't see belly spot uh, phenotypes, but you do see that for other ribosome protein mutants. And it's not quite clear why this happens. There's, there's many theories in this field about how this might be happening. But suffice it to say that this is pretty much the different flavors of phenotypes you would see when different ribosome proteins are, are knocked out. And these are typically half one sufficient uh, phenotypes. So we thought to ourselves, okay, would our Ronin or HCF1 mutants exhibit any of these defects that might also indicate a ribosomopathy. 
And sure enough, we do. We see almost all of them. Um, so we can pick up exencephaly from these mutants. We can pick up homeotic transformations. We can pick up a kinked tail phenotype. We can pick up, of course, craniofacial defects they told you about, polydactyly. And most importantly, we see a, a distinct belly spot phenotype that's 100% penetrant in the HCFC1 uh, hemizygous mice. This is typically a classical phenotype that indicates a ribosome uh, defect. Um, so we thought this is pretty good evidence that whatever changes in, in the ribosome that's occurring is causing a pathology that's due to ribosome defect. But we weren't quite satisfied with that answer just yet. So we went ahead and did one extra experiment. So we focused on the king tail and belly spot phenotype because it was known that the, the RPL24 mutant, which is the, the classical belly spot and tail mouse, has these phenotypes and it was available uh, to us. So we decided to take these mice, cross it to the HCF one mice to see if they were able to genetically interact. And of course they did. So we saw quite a robust interaction between the HCF1 mutation and the RPL24 mutation. We see a dramatic expansion of the belly spot. Um, we also see increased runtedness of the mice, as well as a, a further shortening of the tail, the king tail. So we think this is really good evidence that CBLX is indeed a ribosomopathy. Um, but we, we're still not quite sure um, what's wrong with these mice, but I can tell you right now that we think that, that there's two aspects of the syndrome. One is, of course, the deregulation of MMA-CHC that causes the cabalamin deficiency and leads to the buildup of MMA homocysteine and gives you these phenotypes that you would typically see in a CBLC patient. But on top of that, due to the defects in, in the uh, expression of the ribosome biogenesis genes, such as the ribosome uh, proteins, we see deregulated uh, protein translation, and then somehow something goes awry um, with translation and that leads to ribosomopathy of phenotypes as well. So the big hanging question here, several big hanging questions, is what is the primary ribosome defect leading to this ribosomopathy? And this is going to require a lot more uh, detail about the chemistry to answer, and maybe I'm not the best person to do it, but it's probably something like impaired trans translation fidelity or inefficient elongation or early termination. Um, the misfold of protein might be also uh, related to this. Um, it may also be ultra-ribosome stoichiometry. So it's becoming more and more appreciated in this field that when you knock out certain ribosome protein subunits, others bind to the complex and it changes transcript specificity. So you can sometimes get ectopic translation of mRNA that should not be translated because the ribosome has changed its affinity for a certain transcript. But we have no evidence for this at the moment. And of course, there could be other issues that we're simply not aware of. But hopefully one day we can answer this um, and we'll see where it goes. But that's all I had to say today. I just wanna really thank uh, my lab. So this this was a big uh, push by uh, both a postdoc, Anita M11, and a student, uh, Tiffany, along with technical support from my lab manager, Shafe. Um, they did most of the work in this, in this on this project. Um, I also wanna thank my collaborators, in particular, David Rosenblatt, who's been really instrumental in helping us characterize some of the Kabbalah disorders. I want to thank my funding sources and, and give a shout out for uh, a new post position I'm, I'm hoping to fill in the lab in the next few months. So with that, I, I thank you and I'll take any questions. Hi, Dr. Pache, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you for joining us. And that was an amazing amount of work, tons of new mouse models, really exciting to see that and, um, and sort of some more work on the pathophysiology. We have a few questions in the chat. Um, so the first one is, did you attempt to compare the facial phenotypes of Covalent X and C with those in patients um, compared to the mouse models? Yeah. We have not done that yet. We've, we've considered it. I mean, there, there, there are ways to do this. There's software now. And actually, uh, here at Baylor, uh, we, we do this regularly. We just haven't done it yet. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, how closely their the morphology changes uh, uh, coincide between the two. Yeah, we don't, we don't know. Yeah. And sort of to build on that question, you know, one of the primary features of the, the Cabalamin X patients are severe neurological impairment, right, with seizures and, and, you know, profound intellectual disability. I was wondering if you see anything like that in the mice or was, and was, if... Yeah, that was something yeah. I get this question. So, we, so okay. when we made the, the CBLX mice, the first thing we did was behavioral assays and, and histology um, on the brain. Um, we do see cortical thinning 
Um, I didn't show that today. We see some brain abnormalities. We see loss of glia. Um, behaviorally, we didn't see anything that was very convincing. We, we did EEGs to look for seizures. And I think the problem is, since this is sub-viable wine, mm -hmm. I think by the time we get the mice to adulthood, those are the less, obviously the less affected ones, and they're maybe not manifest in these more severe CNS phenotypes. The other issue is they're in a black six background, and that sometimes suppresses epilepsy, so we have to maybe make them congenic on a DBA background to maybe unmask that. So yeah, so it was very disappointing to be thought we'd see some really interesting behavioral phenotypes, but no, no such luck, but we're still working on it. Yeah, well, great. That's great that you, I'd be really interested to uh, hear more about the pathology in the brain. Fantastic. So a couple of more questions. Um, did the transgenic expression of MMACHC rescue the retinopathy? I presume they're asking about the Ronin. Uh, right. Yes. Um, so the, the rest of the null mice, so the, the null mice have no eye, basically, right? A very, uh, very small, undeveloped eye. It, it completely rescues that. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the Ronin, Mutant conditional eclipse, it did not, our trend gene did not rescue that. Oh, no, we don't know yet. Yeah, we're, we're not quite sure. So, the retinopathy, of course, is of, of great interest to us because we are a retinal lab uh, primarily. And we, we've done five conditional eclipse so far in different departments of the eye, none of which have given us a retinal phenotype. So, either we hadn't found the cell of origin of the phenotype yet, or the mouse is just different from the human in this regard. Mm -hmm. Right, right. All right, one last question. Uh, you showed involvement of the cytoplasmic ribosomal function. Did you also find an impact on mitochondrial ribosomal function? Yeah, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, it's, it's difficult to interpret these data, I think, because that would be expected to result in like mitochondrial defects maybe in ETC. We know that Ronin already regulates genes in the electric transport chain. So those data, it might be hard to much, but it's primarily due to the mitochondrial um, uh, translation versus ETC function. But, so we haven't really tackled that yet because this is a complex issue, I think, to answer. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I, we, we ran out of time, but I um, appreciate you being here and congratulations on all the, the new mouse models and, and data. Okay, thanks. So the next speaker is Dr. Brody. And he is a at NHGRI here, and he's a director of the Division of Genomics and Society. And his major area of investigation over the years has been focused on the genetics of neural tube defects and other birth defects, and the involvement of B12 and folate metabolism. And today he's going to tell us about his work on transcobalamin receptor and transcobalamin 2 in mice and zebrafish and humans. Thank you, Dr. Brody. Hey. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. As you'll see in the program, we are now at close to the in-between organic acids and homocysteine section. Uh, in my talk today, I'll touch on a little bit of both, but I'll mainly focus on the genetics uh, related to methylmalonic acid. Uh, unlike some of the other talks, we're going to look at multiple organisms in multiple situations, uh, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, one of the underlying um, major questions in, in my group is to try to be able to understand how we get to phenotype by looking at both the genes and the environmental exposures, and shown at the top of this slide is just the terms of the equation to get to phenotype. It's genetics plus environment plus genetics and environment plus genetics and genetics. Uh, and working in the system that we do, we're hoping to be able to actually measure all of those components. The system we're working in is looking at gene nutrient interactions and we do so because one, they are a public health concern. We have a lot of um, classical biochemistry that is nicely described all the pathways. Uh, there's numerous variants, genetic variants in these genes that are cataloged and annotated. There's uh, pathologic states that have been well-documented both in animal models and in people. Uh, importantly, the environmental exposure we can measure uh, in the form of analytes quite often. And the reason we're doing this research is to try to get interventions that could essentially improve health. A lot of what you're hearing today and a lot of um, what you have will hear uh, comes from the clinic, meaning the patient or the, the person you're hearing about 
came to attention because they ended up in a clinic of some sort because they were ill. We do a little bit of that, but I want to talk a little bit more about the advantages of going outside the clinic and, and looking out in the air, the world where uh, the healthy individuals live. And we can use this to help understand individuals who are less than healthy. It's also important, we think, to look throughout the life cycle uh, from the newborn setting to the student, young, healthy setting, and to the elderly. And I will be talking today about uh, studies using all of these different uh, ascertainment mechanisms. Uh, the reason that we think this is important, uh, shown on this slide, are the number of B12 tests that are paid for by Medicare every day, seven days a week in the United States is 15,000 a day. For Medicare alone, it's the 17th most ordered test is um, a test for B12. And the US government spends $100 million on B12 tests in the elderly alone. You can imagine that testing for B12 status across the country is probably upwards of two or three times that. Um, the US spends about, the individuals in the US spend about $36 billion a year on nutritional supplements. That's almost the entire NIH budget spent every year on nutritional supplements, many of which have no benefit at all. And as a geneticist, I've also uh, been keeping an eye on the direct to consumer market. And you can see here the direct to consumer market for genetic testing is now approaching a billion dollars a year. The testing that is done in, to help advise in nutrition and diet uh, is mostly scientifically weak. I'll just be upfront about that. And uh, we really don't want people to pay for genetic testing that has no value. So understanding the gene nutrient interaction can help uh, with all of these issues. As you've seen before, the, one of the major crossroads of metabolism that we're interested in is the two enzymes that are uh, dependent upon B12, uh, methionine synthase and methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. You've heard a lot about these. Uh, importantly, both enzymes, when they're not functioning well, have markers to show that they're not uh, happy, and that's homocysteine for the upper reaction and methylmalonic acid for the lower reaction. Uh, just highlight those because you'll be seeing measurements of those two metabolites as we go through the talk. I'll also um, let you know that we're talking about three different studies uh, systems, mice, humans, and fish. And I will, the slides are all coded. So in the upper right-hand corner, in case you've lost track or I lose track, is which organism I'm talking about. Today, I'll talk about the function of the cobalamin receptor, uh, the transcobalamin receptor, a gene known as CD320. Uh, in both humans and in mice. And I'll talk a little bit about transcobalamin in zebrafish, uh, where we think we can phenocopy transcobalamin receptor defects by looking at zebrafish. And uh, we have not been able to find the, the original, the, the receptor for transcobalamin in zebrafish at this point. First, to show, start with some published work. Um, I just remind you that most metabolites in normal healthy individuals have a range of levels. Uh, shown here is homocysteine in a healthy population. This happened to be uh, college students. And, and we know that there are some outliers and beyond a certain point of homocysteine, even in a healthy population, you see people who have very high levels. Uh, these people are not sick, they don't have any pathologic states, but yet they're either the range of normal or they're heading toward a pathologic state. Uh, that's just the metabolite. We know that metabolites interact. So if I take homocysteine and plot it against uh, serum folate, which is known to, to eliminate or reduce homocysteine, you'll see the distribution of homocysteine changes. It's only high in the lowest uh, values of folate, either for probably in this population for low intake. So you get high homocysteines only when serum folate is low. And even in this situation, most of the folks with low folate have also have low homocysteine, but there are outliers. I can take these data and add one other quick dimension to it, and that's the genotype. The MTHFR is well known to affect homocysteine levels. So here you see individuals plotted who have the wild type or, or 
the uh, fully functioning enzyme. And there, the relationship bef between folate and homocysteine is blunted in these individuals because their enzyme works pretty efficiently. I switched that to those carrying the less efficient enzyme. You can see at the same levels, you get higher people who have home high homocysteine uh, at the same level of folate. And just go back and forth quite quick to see those differences. This is what we're seeing when we look at three dimensions uh, of the metabolism. We want to go back to something we published a bit that I think would be of in interest to this audience. And that was a question we asked in the healthy population, do common variants influence MMA levels? And the answer is yes, that we've published, but let me just show you what, why that is. Uh, so shown here is a genome-wide association study of methylmalonic acid. And we find the strongest signal, both in magnitude of effect as well as statistical significance, is the HIB-CH gene. And it was a surprise because it's not involved in any of the one carbon B12 axes that I mentioned. It's actually involved in um, branched chain amino acid degradation. Here's the genetic effect. Uh, these are standard errors. That's why they're so small. The spread is higher. But you can see there's a big difference uh, from genotype in the MMA levels. These are all normal MMA levels. Abnormal is shown up here. We thought as people age that the signal would get washed out. And we were quite surprised that the signal of the genotype in this area continued to be an effect and pushed everything up. So I would just encourage those of you that study high levels of methylmalonic acid to, to look at this locus and see if it's influencing the MMA in your patients. Um, this is a reminder, this is what this enzyme does. And we think it's just essentially the one variant is more efficient at going through this pathway and increasing MMA. I want to change gears to, to show you some quick data from mice and fish, uh, mice and receptor and TC2 in the fish. And the reason we work in these systems is because we can actually use a study design that's shown here. We can manipulate the genes and we can have knockouts for the genes of interest, and then we can manipulate the diet. So we're doing the two axes right now of metabolites and genes. And we can actually do comparisons of all these groups. It's a, re it's a pretty powerful study design. Uh, in work that uh, David Bernard has done, uh, he, uh, along with Others in the lab and independently by Ed Quadros in New York have deleted the CD320 or the cobalamin, transcobalamin receptor. And I'll just show you one highlight from David's work in that he can produce mice that have anemia, uh, the hallmark of the late onset vitamin B12 deficiency, but he only sees the anemia in the animals when he changes the diet. So if we keep these animals on regular levels of B12, not pharmacologic, but normal levels of B12, they never get anemic. If we have control animals on a low B12 diet, they never get anemic. But if we have the combination of the diet and the gene effect, we see anemia presenting in these mice. And if, for the hematologist in the audience, it is a macrocytic anemia. And so it really does mimic the type of anemia you would see in B12 deficiency. One of the things that we can also do in this system is we can do crosses. So here we have um, the mom and the dad crossed. If the, we cross a dad knockout with a mom wild type, we produce this genotype. If we do the cross the other way, we produce the same genotype in the offspring. And the question we can ask, does it matter who your mother was or who your father was? And the answer is yes, it does matter. When the knockout is carried by the father, and we cross that with a wild type animal. All of these are on B12 deficient diet. We get plenty of offspring and they're normal. When we do the cross the other way, so all of these, all of these animals are heterozygotes. We do the cross the other way, we get no animals, showing that we, the maternal genotype and maternal diet actually does matter. I'm gonna to switch to fish right now very quickly where we've taken out the transcobalamin gene. And just to show you that when we do what we call the first generation of fish, so these are fish that are the first generation homozygotes for not having a transcobalamin gene. Uh, these fish are healthy, they grow. Uh, an astute student in the lab thought they were a little smaller. So Courtney Benoit in the lab actually measured this and it turns out the homozygotes are a little bit smaller. It looks like their growth rate is about the same. They just start out smaller. But again, these have no trans transcobalamin at all. 
they are healthy and they live a long life. Uh, they're just a little smaller. But what happens when we go to the second generation? Here we've done the same experiment we've done to mice in, in design. If we have animals that are wild type, wild type knockout, knockout wild type, in every combination, they're fine, they're healthy, um, they grow uh, for several days post fertilization, which is what point we stop this the project. But if we do the cross where we're crossing homozygote knockouts with homozygote knockouts, producing all homozygous offspring. This is the red line. Those animals soon after fertilization start to, to die. Uh, the same is true if we cross the knockout mother with the wild type, just like in the mice, these animals die. If dad is the knockout shown over here, these animals are fine. So you may ask yourself, how are we getting transgenerational and maternal effects in fish? Uh, and the answer is that fish uh, do have a placenta equivalent. The yolk sac is provisioned by the parent. So what we're seeing in this first, second, and third generation effect is probably the diminution of nutrients being supplied to the offspring from the mom. Uh, so it's a, a, a nice model for being able to look at maternal effects in a species that doesn't really have any maternal uh, carrying at all. I want to switch back to humans again, and this point, newborn humans, uh, and switch back to the transcobalamin receptor again. Uh, many years ago, we discovered that a variant, a deletion of uh, glutamic acid in um, the, the 88th amino acid of the receptor showed to be, appeared to be a risk factor for having a, a child with a neural tube defect. Um, and that was this odds ratio here. We also knew from the work of David Rez Rosenblatt, a very nice collaborator, that these, this particular variant didn't bind B12 as well. And in work I'm going to show you a second is shown, it has been presented in patients who show up in newborn screening having high organic acids, in this case, the C3 propionic screening metabolite. We had also done a genome-wide association study looking at this variant in healthy students. Uh, I mean, looking at the entire genome in healthy students and found that this particular gene, the receptor, uh, influences the level of TC2 in the blood uh, in healthy individuals. We were able to deconstruct that a bit. It turns out that same variant, this E88 del, if I look at individuals who carry it, who are heterozygote for it, they have significantly higher plasma B12 levels, serum B12 levels. And that's probably because they're not moving B12 as efficiently into their cells, which is the job of this receptor. Uh, so they won't look like they're B12 deficient, even though their cells might be slightly deprived of the, deficient of the vitamin. We can take this and deconstruct the B12 into two different pools. Those of you that, that study this know haptocorin is the most B12 that's circulating in your blood, but it's a different kind of maybe less bioavailable pool. And it turns out E88 del does not affect the level of haptocorin in the blood, but it does affect the level of uh, holotranscobalamin, uh, the active portion, the highly turnover portion. So its impact is uh, potentially even stronger metabolically because it is moving the active form of B12 less efficiently into the cells. Because of this, we, we wanted to know, is there any clinical significance to this variant? It clearly has been presented in newborn screening in a few times, and it um, would be really important to know if kids who have this or individuals who have this have any concerning phenotypes. So we, we wanted to know how many cases, in this case, cases are newborn screening positive individuals carry this, this variant, and how many, variant, how many cases, how many individuals who do carry this variant don't show up in newborn screening. And to do that, we teamed up with the um, really wonderful collaborators in New York State, um, Denise Kay and Michelle Kajana, to look at their study population. And we were able to study um, from New York State, all of the high C3 screening positive uh, kids presented in newborn screening uh, for a two-year period. And New York's a big state, so that's a lot of individuals. And here are the people we studied. Uh, we most interested in this population. These are 
And this population, these are individuals who had a high level of the newborn metabolite enough to be either referred or repeated, and, but upon repeat, they seemed normal. Uh, we also included for uh, completeness some several individuals who had later subsequently confirmed methylmalonic acidemia or some one of the cobalamin defects. Uh, we also included the equal number of controls in this study and the controls were ethnically matched to all of the cases. Uh, this is what we found when we said, do we see E88 in the controls? We saw a few heterozygotes. We saw no homozygotes in the controls. Uh, we then asked, what do we see in the, in the babies who screen positive? We saw a small number, but a significant number, seven cases of this homozygote status in the screen positive cases. Remember, these were screen positive, but subsequently found to have normal levels of either C3 or NMA upon further examination. The question remains, do we worry about these kids? One of the ways to address that is to say how many kids, uh, how many newborns are not showing up in the screen. And because we have good estimates, both from New York State and from uh, general databases of the frequency of this allele, we can project how many children in New York are born with this exact genotype in a given year. I'll also note, and I'll come to this in a second, that there are five of the cases where uh, in self or system identified uh, babies of Latino origin. Uh, showing you graphically what we found, New York for those two year periods has over 600,000 births. We studied 362 newborns with elevated C3 upon newborn screening. We found, uh, we studied 12 of them who had confirmed Mendelian conditions. Uh, those did not have this variant, so it doesn't seem like it helps present with the Mendelian condition. But we found seven who had this exact genotype in this pool. Because of the genotypes, we were able to actually look at the same birth years, parse them out by ethnicity, and then apply genotype and allele frequencies to predict how many individuals are born in New York in this two-year period out of the 600,000 that might have this genotype. And what you'll see, there's 26 um, in this group, seven in this group, six in this group. 41 total should have been born that year, uh, yet we only saw seven presenting with high C3. So for every one that presents, there's almost five kids that are born that have the same exact genotype that are not presenting. I think this sows a fair bit of doubt on the clinical significance of this variant, at least in the newborn period. We have other data that uh, we're working on now with other collaborators, including Rosen, David Rosenblatt, David Watkins, that would suggest that this is a variant that is out there in the population that under certain conditions can produce a screen positive, but is not a, a serious in need of treatment condition. I uh, just want to end with an observation that I mentioned a few minutes ago. In New York, we saw that there seemed to be uh, an abundance of this genotype in uh, identified uh, babies who were identified as Latino uh, and were Hispanic. Uh, we then asked a couple of other states, uh, notably, uh, yeah, they received data from Arkansas and from Missouri. What did the distribution of high C3 uh, kids look like with regard to race or ethnicity in their population. And in all three states, there seems to be an overabundance of Latino slash Hispanic ethnicities in the high C3. Uh, as every good geneticist should do, when you see something like this, your first thought should be there might be some social or physical environmental reason for it. It's a mistake to immediately assume it's something genetic or biological, and we had population data in New York that says it probably isn't. Uh, we have some hints as to why this particular uh, identified ethnic group might be presenting more often with high C3s, but we still have yet to test them. So for those of you out there, I suggest that if you work with state labs to take a look and see if you see the same thing in your state or your country. Um, so to conclude in this section, uh, there are very few cases that show up uh, in the, compared to what we should, and most of the cases that we know would have the, the DEL-DEL genotype do not present in newborn screening and are considered healthy kids. I just want to close with saying I uh, hope I've shown you that by using three different systems and different ascertainment, 
uh, in looking at individuals that we can use the combined power of all these systems to answer relatively important questions for humans in humans, but also using other organisms as well. So I thank all of you for your attention and I look forward to questions during the question and answer period. Thank you. Oh, these are the people who did all of the work and I have just the lucky person who gets to present it. Hi, Dr. Brody. Thank you for joining us and thanks for a wonderful talk. Hello, Jennifer. We have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one is, it has been shown recently that the avian CD320 receptor paralog, TVA, is involved in retroviral and whole OTC entry. Are there any data on the possible role of human CD320 in retroviral infection susceptibility? And could there be any evolutionary advantage for TCR mutation carriers? Um, great question, Victor. The, yeah. the straight answer is I have no idea. Um, and there probably are cohorts that would be uh, available to look that have already been either genotyped or sequenced. So uh, we can potentially do that, or if the, the data are free, freely available, other folks could do it. But it's uh, not a hypothesis I had thought of. Yeah, interesting concept. Uh, the next question is, have you looked for the transcobalamin defects um, and if they might be enriched in patients with pernicious anemia? So we have, um, have looked at elderly who were at risk for pernicious anemia and were, were ascertained just because they were elderly, not because they had pernicious anemia. But when we find the relatively few um, receptor homozygotes, they are not enriched for people who have anemia. It's a slightly different study design. Um, uh, Dr. Sidram actually asked about transcobalamin. I'm answering about the receptor. I believe others have looked at a couple of the transcobalamin variants uh, that are some of them which are more common than others. And I think most of those data are not incredibly strong for saying they're involved in pernicious anemia. Uh, I would put my money probably on there being an enrichment of some receptor defects. Uh, and, and those paradoxically would show up more often in patients who had higher levels of B12 in their blood, despite the fact that they were getting less to their um, hematopoietic system. Great, thanks. I had one additional question um, about the you know, maternal effects of the CD320 and the transcobalamin 2. Um, fish. So these are fascinating that you see, um, you know, these intergenerational effects of B12 deficiency. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on on the mechanism. I know you talked about the placenta and the fish, but how about in the mice? So in in the mice, it's a the fish is a relatively straightforward explanation because we can think about dilution, um, and the fish provide the the yolk, and then just disperse the eggs and they're done with it. Uh, it's a little bit harder to understand in, in the mice uh, in that uh, we know that in mammals that the mammalian placenta will also will often concentrate things, sometimes at the detriment of the, the parent, uh, and it makes sense evolutionary-wise that would happen. Uh, we don't have um, a, a measurement, direct measurements in placental tissue, uh, but I would suspect, especially because the death and we in data I didn't show the death in these mice is actually pretty early in development, that they're just not being able to support enough early development. And that is a case where um, the, we're losing the mice before the placenta is fully formed. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't get to play its concentrating and active transport role. So I, I think it's probably just not enough around to provision very early development. Like the um, previous talk, we also have mice that we can uh, help along with B12 who then die um, soon after. And we don't know the mechanism of death either, although we've not done as many nice studies uh, as the previous speaker. Very fascinating studies and worth uh, following up on for sure. One additional last question. I was curious about the TCN2 fish. Um, you know, certainly that 
condition in, in humans is quite severe or can be quite severe. I was just wondering why, why do you think you see a milder phenotype in, in your fish model? Um, I mean, the, the answer is that we do see a severe phenotype two generations in, mm -hmm. um, and that's essentially inviability. Uh, we can rescue them just by letting them letting the embryos develop in water that has a fair bit of B12 in it. And then we could recapitulate the whole thing. We haven't done this, but presumably we could recapitulate this whole reset to the first generation. Mm. Uh, the uh, fish have two other transcobalamins uh, that we've uh, published a paper on characterizing that are, that are quite interesting because they are missing more than half of the, the what we thought was the required amount of protein uh, structure to, to transport B12. So it's possible that these two other um, transporters play a role uh, and it's not compartmentalized as much as it is in humans where the, the analogs for intrinsic factor um, and, ha and haptocorin are really kept in certain compartments. So it could be those other paralogs. Uh, I will tell you we have some evidence because we have knocked out those paralogs that they don't have the same exact phenotype, but they do seem to contribute to a B12 um, developmental phenotype. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brody. I appreciate your talk and congratulations on all the interesting work. Um, that concludes the end of our session two, and we're going to take a break for lunch or dinner, depending on your time zone, and everyone should return around uh, at 1230 for the next session on the homocystinarias. Thanks, everybody.